If I take anything from Hyperforce, is that it showed me that I was too hard on my experience running Rider three years ago. With the popularity boom of D&D streaming from Geek and Sundry to even Team Four Star, one would think that I, as an RPG connoisseur, would be in on that. However, that's not entirely the case. With the exception of the rare few like Winter's Edge and Mecha GM, I don't watch a whole lot for three simple reasons. For starters, most use either D&D 5th Edition or Pathfinder, though that's skewed far more towards the former. I've made my stance regarding playing just the world's greatest role-playing game, and these streams are no exception. Second, because they go for D&D 5th or Pathfinder, they end up going with the same setup for their style of fantasy, falling into the generic trap or the Tolkien melting pot that I've talked about repeatedly over the years. And finally, on a more personal note, I don't want any undue influence on my own work. I try to only take influence from stuff I want to, in my own style. I don't wish to try and emulate other GMs or follow a set course of it's how it should be done. Doing things my way has always been my mantra, and it's one I hold to in my designs. On the other end of the ring is Hyper RPG's Power Rangers themed campaign, Power Rangers Hyperforce. Hyperforce is an RPG campaign using an original system created in collaboration with Saban Brands. As such, the events of the game are in canon with Power Rangers' timeline. It starts several years after the events of Time Force and ventures into eras of the past, future, and other dimensions as our heroes contend with a force known as the Alliance. Some of you may recall that I've had my own experience with running a tokusatsu-themed RPG, Rider the Transformation. I've had a harsh opinion on how I ran that game and the mechanics I assumed I had to use. And since then, I've considered on more than one occasion how to fix or reboot the system. It's for this reason that Hyperforce intrigued me, an opportunity to compare notes on other folks' work and see how someone else might do it. That was the primary reason why I gave my attentions to this project. So a longtime fan of tokusatsu like me should be all ready to get in bed with it, right? Not exactly, because nothing's ever that simple. I'll get some of the positives out of the way first. When things are on point, it's an entertaining watch. There's some clear direction at play, and the dice gods do what they do best. Namely, screw over everyone, especially Peter. But the MVP of the group is most definitely Paul Schreier, who always seemed to know how to be on point. Now before I dive into my criticisms, I want to make clear I don't hate the campaign. I understand and even praise what the experience of this show has meant to many people. However, universal praise does no favors and nothing is beyond reproach. Subsequently, I will not accept the that's how it worked on the show excuse. I am judging this as an RPG campaign first and foremost. For starters, it seems there's an issue of flow overall. The season was always meant to have 25 episodes. That means that every episode must count. Every episode must advance things forward in one way or another. I'd say about two-thirds of the episodes feel like one-shot stories as opposed to ones that advance the overall story. One aspect that does not help this matter is the guest appearances. As great as some of the guests were, Mike Jin especially comes to mind, I think they held back the overall pace of the narrative. When they appear, the story has to slow down or stop for the sake of not bogging them down leading to a start-stop flow that got a little bit irritating. Well, that's probably not the best word, but you get my point. Some of this may have been the result of writing for multiple seasons, but in my opinion, that is a mistake. A season, in this sense, should have a degree of self-containment, with just enough seas to follow up on if desired or if able. RPGs may be about improvisation, but if you're doing a set story, you can't be full freeform at the same time. The tiers and tentpoles approach a la Gargoyles is a nice compromise, but unfortunately that is not the route they took. Hyperforce has touted that it would use a system tailor-made for the story, made by the GM, Malika Lim. Since the finer details of the game are not known to me, take everything I say here with a grain of salt. If a full book is released, I may change my stance on a few matters. With that said, I do not particularly care for how the game handles team attacks. Essentially, everyone has to roll successfully or the attack fails. Power Rangers is supposed to have teamwork as a primary theme, but this approach seems a little too swingy and almost discourages team attacks. I know about the intent, but that intent is no excuse to punish players in such a manner without some form of fail forward. Furthermore, the game's mechanics feel a little incomplete. Like a 24-hour RPG where they've come up with the core mechanics but little in the way of exceptions or expansions. This would come up in cases where it was clear the rules were being made up on the fly or added in to make up for deficiencies they didn't see coming. Giving Eddie healing charges is one blatant example that I noticed. In addition, I kept asking, why does the game need cards? Yes, there's a card system in story with the Morphers, but the cards themselves feel like a glorified index reference. There's nothing wrong with that, 
but the game doesn't seem to demand the level of crunch to necessitate those references, especially since several of the abilities get unused or underutilized due to being unoptimized for the encounters set up. In these kind of cases, I often hear that a tabletop RPG is about story, so this is fine. I do not necessarily agree, since at the end of the day this is still a game, and games need clear, concise rules for as many scenarios as possible because the players will go through as many scenarios as feasible. Just because a game is more narrativist does not give it a pass. And I do know the video that Malika made explaining the mechanics, but since that only went into the core mechanics, it's little more than a tease for me. Things like how the dice work, the significance of a lightning bolt, what advantage is, why cards are used on the sheets, and how advancement works are a few matters that are hardly discussed. I have heard from my colleagues that the work Saban Brands was doing was trying a little too hard to be like the good old days of Season 1 Power Rangers. I can see that to a certain extent here. While some of that is certainly on Saban's part, with the cross-promotion of the comic and the promotion of certain guests, I feel the blame still falls on both parties. The campaign seems more interested in homaging the past instead of crafting its future. While it does things with the past, the material that is wholly their own is a smaller part of the equation. Not to put myself on a pedestal, but when I developed the writer campaign, my intent was never to make it merely another season of Common Writer. I wanted to use the extra space afforded to me to create a campaign that would allow for multiple stories and story angles with the different factions and potential and obstacles. Now granted, I had a lot more freedom than Hyper RPG did likely, but my intent was always to create a guided experience, not a script. Now I may have given the impression that I hate Hyperforce. I don't. I just think it has some glaring issues to look into if a second season ever comes, or if someone else tries something similar. There are pieces of potential to create a new experience, but I feel the fan enthusiasm to reference old events reduces that potential. To put it another way, Hyperforce is more interested in being a Power Rangers show than a Power Rangers RPG. I can only hope that in time, those nostalgia glasses can be traded in for a pair of engineering goggles.